God's house. This is Ryan. Yes, I have an accent. Oh, and some announcements. Every Tuesday, we will be having a prayer service. It starts at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. Oh, and it's weekly. See you there. Next up, we have baptism. If you are interested in being baptized during service on Sunday, January 22nd, that means you have a week to do it. So sign up like right now, as fast as you can or like tomorrow, but really fast, okay? Like really, really fast. Here's the link, just do it right now, okay? Right now, I beg of you, please, right now. Yeah! Next up, we have the God's House Youth. That includes me. We will be going to Crazy Pins next week after church, AKA January 22nd. Uh. January 22nd, excuse me. This includes kids grade six to 12. Six, 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 twelve, twelve, twelve. Our last announcement is about next. Well, it is next, but it's next orientation. Do you want to become a part of God's house and plugged in ba -ding, ba -ding, to this community? Or even just learn about the church? Then next is your next step. Join us today church in the Center for Uncommon Living. You get some snacks, we'll learn about each other, it'll be fun, good time. And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Fun Facts with Ryan. Did you know that the bad dogs in movies are actually good dogs trained to be bad? Until next week, this is Ryan signing off. Now you know what's next. Let's get pumped for the message! All right, all right. If you guys will stand to your feet this morning. Good morning, welcome to God's house. If I haven't met you, my name is Pastor DJ and I get the privilege of pastoring this awesome church. We also wanna give a shout out to those who are watching online. Hey, hey, online audience. Thank you for those of you that tune in each week. Uh, some have asked online, I'm just gonna talk to them for a minute, if you guys can just hold on. Some have asked online how they can get involved with our church. We meet here in Marion, Indiana. Um, but also, you can contribute financially on our website at visitgodshouse.com. So can we give a shout out for everybody online? Now here, now listen, listen, y'all that are here. This does not mean you can stay home and not come to church. This is just for us to broaden our impact, hopefully around the world. And actually our friends in Zambia, we have a partner church in Zambia and they watch our services here too. So this is really cool. The song we sang this morning, that song about one heart and one bride and one mind, uh, Wesley, our worship leader actually wrote that song and he gave that to the team in Africa. So we're now singing same songs that our church has written both in the US and in Africa. Hello, that is amazing. And uh, you'll notice there's a jar up here. I'm just giving a little couple things here. There's a jar up here. If you ever wanna contribute to what's going on in Africa, that is a way you can do it at any time in that jar up there. All right, so who's ready for the message? All right, so here's what I need right now as you're standing. I need 12 people who will come sit up on this platform while I preach. Oh, don't all run at once now. Come on, I need 12 people who will come up here and sit on this platform while I preach. Come on, anybody? I need 12. We don't want to be here all day. If you want to eat today, come on. One, two. Come on, I need 10 more. Anthony, can you join me? Come on. And I need some people who aren't afraid to shout, maybe. You don't have to, but if you'd like to. Come on. Oh, thanks, bro. Appreciate Appreciate it. Come just have a seat anywhere you want. Come on. We got, we got four, guys. That's four. Four minus 12. My, okay, that would be negative eight. Never mind. Come on down. Come on, thanks, babe. Look at the look at that lady. Come on now. Dave, okay, where are we at now? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Janet, come on, Janet. Anybody else? 
Julian, you could come join your lady up here. I mean, come on, if you're going to dress nice, you might as well be in front of everybody. I walked in this morning, and he looked like that, and I said, I need to go home and change. I'm too casual. Is that 12? Here, you two want to come over here so you can be, okay. We need one more. Come on, where's the one? One person. Come on, CJ. Thank you so much for my illustrated sermon. All right, I, I promise you I won't keep you standing too much longer, but if while you're standing you want to grab your Bible or it'll be on the screen, we are going to turn to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to read a lot of scripture today. So flex your muscles, flex your feet. You know you stand at times, right? It's all good. Turn your Bible to Judges chapter 6. If you don't have it, it will be on the screen, and we're going to have some fun this morning. You guys glad to be here? All right, I feel like this whole front section just emptied out. If, you all, if anybody wants to come sit down front, you can do that too. All right, Judges chapter 6. And we're looking right now at verses 1 and 2. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. So here's what I just want you to know I did for you this week. It's the new year. If you've been in church long, I know you try to, uh, to read your Bible usually at the beginning of the years when you get real committed, like I'm going to read my Bible. And I know some of you haven't done it. I just know you haven't. So I'm going to just give you enough scripture today to fulfill the last 15 days of the year, and you can start again tomorrow, all right? Judges chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. If you have it, give me a shout. Either Okay. Either it's real quiet up in here, or we ain't got the scripture. So let's look at the screen. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of the Midianites was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Now turn over to verse 11 of Judges chapter 6. Stay in the same chapter. Jump down to verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abezrite. Where, the, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now turn over to Judges chapter 7 because we're going somewhere this morning. It's a lot of scripture, but follow along as I read uh, quite a bit of scripture this morning in Judges chapter 7. It's the story of Gideon and the battle with the Midianites. It says, early in the morning, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men to deliver Midian into your hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left. Say 22,000. 22,000 men left and 10,000, say 10,000. Remains. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift you, sift them from you there. If I say, This one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men, say 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths like a dog, and all the rest of them got down to their knees to drink. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. We're going to stop right there this morning. Will you pray with me? And then you can have a seat. God, I thank you for your word this morning. 
I thank you for what you want to teach us out of the story of Gideon's life. I thank you for what you want to teach us on this uh, Sunday that stands before a historic day in our nation, Martin Martin Luther King Day, on a day that we say as a church that we stand up against injustice and we speak out for those, those who don't have a voice. We pray today, God, that you would speak to us through your word and that you would reveal something new and fresh to us today so that our lives can be inspired and be changed. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. Before you sit down, slap someone a high five and say, who's in, who's in your corner? Who's in your corner? Anybody? Who's in your corner? Who's in your corner? This morning I want to talk to us on the subject, who's in your corner? And it's no accident that tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. A lot of you guys have the day off tomorrow. Am I right? Don't have to go to work. I hear some amens. Come on now. And, but, but the reality is the reason that we don't have to go to work tomorrow is because our nation observes the day 53 years ago where one man stood up to fight against the injustice towards race. And 53 years ago, tomorrow's the day we celebrate it, this man stood before the nation and said, I have a dream. And with him were millions of people who said, we stand with you and we will stand up for justice for all as Americans. And so that day is something we celebrate in looking at who God is and the character of God and how it was revealed through Martin Luther King, who was a pastor. We know him as Dr. Martin Luther King, but he was actually a pastor. And Dr. King had raised up an army of people who would go with him and would stand with him. But if you look at the army of people he raised up, in contrast to the millions of other people who didn't get what he had to say, you could say that Dr. Martin Luther King, like Gideon, was in a place where he thought he'd have millions, he ended up with thousands. Where he thought that he had his 22,000, and God said, no, I don't need all 22,000 of them for you to win this battle. I just need 300 people who are committed to the vision, and I can do great things through your life. And now 53 years later, we live in a nation where racial inequality is getting better and better. Because one man stood up and said, I will fight for injustice regardless of who stands with me. In the more traditional churches, uh, if you grew up in a more traditional church, what you see on our platform this morning may be common to you. If you grew up in a more traditional church, especially if it was more in the charismatic or black church, am I right, Miss Annette? Talk about it. You would have people that sat on the platform with you as you preached. These people were put up here on purpose. They didn't just come out of the, pla- the, 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 you know, walk in the back door and grab a coffee and say, hey, I think I'll sit up there today. They were put up there because these were people who said, I've got your back. I am with you, I am for you, no matter where you go, I will follow you, I've got your back. And when the pastor would get going and get preaching and get real excited, before anyone out there would respond, these people would respond. Probably a little louder than that. I'm just kidding. They would do things, they would do things, can I, excuse me, just for a moment here, can I just borrow your seat? Just sit out there and look pretty, thanks dear. Okay, cool, so... She's my wife, if you don't know. I didn't just take someone's wife. Okay, so they would stand here, and someone would be preaching. Do, 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 imitate me. Can you imitate me? Preaching? Yeah! Come. Okay, okay, now, now, hold on. I just made my day. Okay, so, so do it again, and I'm going to be what the people up here would be. Come on, pastor! Yes, yes, yes! Okay, now you can have a seat. Okay, so... So I'm just giving an illustration. You guys don't have to do that. But if you want to, feel free. Okay. So they would sit up here and they would affirm what the pastor was saying. Now, we're in the middle of this old school school series. That's why we got this amazing podium, which I really just want to keep after old school because I think this is awesome. Not to mention you can see the shoes I pick out. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, but um, – I just, I, just, I just distracted myself again. Okay, but, but in the old school church, they would stand there to affirm, we've got your back, we're in your corner, and if no one else responds, we are for you. And that term is called the amen corner. 
And what I want to talk to us about this morning is who is in your corner? Where is the amen corner in your life? Because sometimes in life as we're going and we're seeking God and we're asking God what we're called to do and where we're supposed to go and how we're supposed to get there, the road sometimes seems real lonely. Anybody else? The road sometimes feels like no one is for you. Sometimes it feels like there's no one that's going to stand up with me. I'm all alone. But when you understand that we together and those behind me, us together, are greater than me alone or me with an army, because me with 12 committed people is way more powerful than me with 500 who aren't committed, you start to change your perspective and realize that what God has called me to is if he will have people stand with me and be ready to go with me, then together we can change the world. So who's in your corner this morning? I'll just, I'll just, we just hold that. I don't wreck it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Trying to be dignified. So this text we read this morning is about a man named Gideon. I love the story of Gideon. If you've been in church long in your life, you may have heard the song. It was an old, I would say, probably very white Baptist church, how I grew up song. It was Gideon, thou Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Nobody else has heard it. That's good. Okay, so um, anyways, but Gideon was this awesome man who had a life that you could say was very simple and actually was very sheltered where we find him in Judges chapter 6. It says that he was with all the Israelites encamped in a place where they were hiding under trees. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and he finds Gideon in this place where he has secluded himself off from everyone around him because of fear of what he thinks could happen if he reveals who he really is. And so God shows up to a man who's been beaten down and crouched down and hiding under a tree so not to be seen so that no one can come and attack him because how many know that when you stand out in front, you're in a very vulnerable place? When you step in to the thing that God puts in your heart to do, something begins to happen and haters going to hate and people going to start talking bad and they're going to tell you that you're this and you said this and you never said none of it. And all of a sudden, everything that you thought you had to do, you stepped into it and it feels like the world is against you. That's the place the Israelites were at this point. These are people who had seen the Red Sea part. These are people who had watched Moses pick up a staff or pick up a snake and turn it into a staff. These are people who had seen all these plagues happen to Egypt and all these things happen where God was delivering the people from Egypt and they watched miracle after miracle after miracle and then we get six books over and they're like this. What happened to get them to a place where they're crouched up where no one could see them? I would argue they forgot who was in their corner. They forgot that they served a God who says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when you lose the reminder in your head that greater is the God who's in you than he who's in the world, you start to live in a way that you have to pull yourself in because you go, God, I can't do that thing you called me to do because what will people think? And the world's big, bad, ugly, I'm gonna help me. You know, they're all gonna scream at me and it's gonna be so scary. And so I'm gonna get backed into a corner. The problem with the Israelites is they were backed into a corner. However, when they got backed into the corner, there was no support to keep them, to pull them back out of that corner. The reason the amen corner is so important in your life is because you need people that as you try to back down and get under here that say, no, I'm going to push you back out into the calling and the destiny of God on your life. And so the Israelites are in this place, and Gideon, as one of them, is at a place, and he's under this tree, and the angel shows up. You ever had God show up? Maybe not in physical form, but he, like, shows up in your circumstance. He shows up in your dreams. He shows up in something in your life, and you literally know that you just encountered the God of the universe. You'll notice something when God shows up. When he shows up, he doesn't come and say, hey, Gideon, you are a mess. 
You're broke as a joke. You've walked out on all your dreams. I delivered you out of Egypt and put you into the promised land so that you could live a flourishing, prosperous life. And now you're under a tree just trying to make enough stuff to keep the Midianites away from you. And you, you forget that I'm greater inside of you with the few that I have created you with than the army that's against you. He, he doesn't say that to us. That might be true, right? I'm all about being truthful with myself. I've learned this. I used to not be truthful, right? I used to just lie to myself. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. I am blessed. You kidding? I'm struggling. I'm hurting. Sometimes we can look at the reality in our life, right? We can, we can look at stuff and situations we're going through, and, and, and you try so hard to have faith, but sometimes you just got to be real. I remember when our son Weston was born, and he was a preemie, and he was born at 29 weeks, and he was in the NICU for 42 days, and, and I was trying to convince myself every time someone said, how is he doing, that I would be like, oh, he's doing great, and he's awesome, and we're just amazing, but what they didn't see was I was going home at night and crying myself to sleep because this little baby that was two pounds, five ounces was locked in a prison, and as a father, I couldn't even hold the baby that was just born. It was really, really hard. And I think sometimes we are in our lives, we try to just ignore the hardness. Life is hard at times. There are things that come against you that will hurt you, that will, the people will say things that will cause you to question everything in your life. Situations will happen to you that you just think, I don't know if I can make it another day. And I don't think it's not having faith to just acknowledge in your situation, things aren't all amazing. But where we miss it is when God enters the picture. Because God doesn't show up to confirm your reality. God shows up to remind you of his glory and what he can do in and through you. And so God comes to Gideon and he says, hey there, mighty warrior. Now, if you know anything about battles and you've watched, you know, Braveheart and some, some war type movies, typically when there's a battle, you don't see the soldiers like this. Shoot. That's the truth. They would get shot if they were like this, right? Like, this is, this, this is not a position of a warrior. What is a warrior position? Where's my yoga people? Anybody? Anybody know yoga? Isn't that a, isn't that a position? Yeah, Miss Janet's a warrior, uh, not a warrior. We are a warrior. You're a yoga person. Can you show us the warrior, posi warrior pose? Come on, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> I just love to, I love, I love to put Janet on the spot. This is so good. If you guys don't know, Janet works for our church, and she's actually, I, really, Janet runs the church. <laughs> but anyway, so thank, thanks for your illustration. So typically, you see a warrior as something that's spread out and big and fighting and guarding. You don't see someone crouched crouch down. But what God does is God comes up, and he doesn't see the situation that Gideon is in, but he sees what's inside of him. And he looks at him, and he says, hey there, mighty warrior. One translation says, mighty man of valor, a man of courage, a man of strength. And Gideon's like, God, I'm down here under the tree. I don't feel very courageous. I don't feel like I got much strength. I don't feel like I have anything left to give. And God says, I see it. I see the warrior in you. The whole rest of Judges chapter 6, which we didn't read this morning, I'll just paraphrase this, basically Gideon and God having this conversation where God says, I've equipped you and I've called you and I want to use you and I've got some things for you to do. And so Gideon goes like, like we all do, but God, I don't know if I can do that, and I, I don't know if that this, and so he, he over and over has these things. He says to God, what if I do this, and then you do this, and what if I do this, and you do this, and God just lets him. He's like, all right, try it. Try it. Test me in this. Let's see. Let's see. Yep, put that, put that thing out at, at night, and he like, puts a rug out, and he's like, God, if, if you really want me to do this, and when I come out in the morning, I want dew all around the rug, but I want no dew on the rug. And he comes out in the morning, and he's like, right, that rug's going to be wet. Like, goes, steps down to, oh, no, there's no splash. Whoa. You see this conversation in this relationship with Gideon and God in Judges chapter 6 where God is beginning to tell Gideon who he is. And through his faith being increased because he says, God, can I try this one more time? He goes three different things. Every time God came through. And by the time he comes out of Judges chapter 6, Gideon is convinced that he is who God called him to be. 
But the thing, when you start being convinced of who you are, when God calls you to do something and you say, I'm going to step into this, is typically in your head, you're, it's a lot bigger than what it really is. Can I be real? I was sitting in this church in 2009, and I was on this fast, and I was praying, and I was asking God what I was supposed to do with my life, and God told me to start a church, and he told me to move back to Michigan and start this church and, and, and to be a pastor, and so and immediately in my mind, I thought the next day I'd just wake up and be popular, because I turned my TV on, and there's Joyce. She, she got there somehow, right? I mean, I didn't know anything about her story that it took her 58 years to get on TV. You know, I, I didn't know all that stuff. I just thought I'd just roll out of bed. Hello, God told me to come. And then I'd show up and there'd be 13 people. There'd be the amount of people on this platform where this was a whole church right here. There was no one to stand in my corner because there was no one to support me from behind because all I was doing is looking at what was ahead. And there was no way to, 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 even, to even see it in my reality. But God just kept reminding me, no, when I call you to something and I put something inside of you, I created you to be something regardless of the circumstances around you. What have you given up on in your life because you think you're not who God said you were? And what if you stepped into that thing and that thing was something that's going to impact and change the world around you? Our inadequacies keep us from stepping out into who God has created us to be when in reality God says, if you'll just step out and do what I've called you to do, I will use your life. And so in Judges chapter 7, finally, basically through conversation, Gideon says, okay, I'll go and I will defeat the enemy that I was hiding from. And so the passage we read, Gideon gathers his men together. And he has 22,000 men because it's bigger than he thought it would be, right? He's got his TV ministry. He's got his private jet plane. He's got his Escalade. I'm just talking to my ego. Is that okay? He's got Gucci shoes, living in a mansion, you know. He's just working for Jesus. And God shows up and he says, hey, 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 I see, all, I see all the abundance. I see everything you've got there, but I actually don't, I don't need 22,000 of them. So just send, 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 send all but 10,000 home. Gideon's like, oh, okay, God, okay, I'm going to trust you. And I don't know if you remember, the Midianite army is already bigger than us. They're way greater than us. We've got to fight them, but, but I'm going to trust you. i got faith. So just send, all right, 10,000 are going home. All right, God, thank you. It's me and my 10,000. Okay, so I'll give you up the Escalade, but I'm keeping the plane. All right, so we got this. We're going. All right, guys. And God shows up again, and he says, hey, Gideon, that's still too much. You don't need all that. You don't, you don't need all the stuff you think you need to build my kingdom. You just need a heart that says, I'll serve you to build my kingdom. And so he shows up, and he looks at Gideon, and he says, all right, Gideon, now take your men down to the water, and let them drink. All right, God, we're going to go get some drink. We think we're going down to get refreshed. And so we get down to the water, ha, ah, ready for the drink. And God's like, now observe how these guys drink, which I think this is hilarious, all right? He says, now observe the people who lap like a dog. Okay, I'm, I'm observing those people. They bring, I'm looking at them, and I'm like, y'all crazy? you crazy. Thank you, Jesus, for those 9,700 people that know how to drink water right. You know what I mean? They got the whole, like, I don't know, that looks more like a dog too. But anyways, like they, you know, like, like they, they know how to do it right. They, they don't look crazy. And God looks at him and he goes, all right, the 300 who lap like do dogs, those are your men. Now, if you're like me, you're like, no, 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 no. Okay. All right, I gave you the 12,000, kept the 10,000. I'm not giving everything else up, God. Have you seen the way they drink water? They lap like dogs. You didn't call me to defeat the Midianites with a bunch of dogs. You called me to defeat them as a mighty warrior. You called me a mighty warrior. Why on earth would you use me with a bunch of dogs? And God goes, because I use the weak things of the world to shame the strong. I use the foolish things to confound the wise. When I show up, people look and they go, how in the world did that nobody out of nowhere raise up and start a church? How in the world did one church in Marion, Indiana start three churches in Africa? How in the world do we have a center for success that is growing, that is up to five locations next year? How did it happen with a bunch of nobodies? 
Because when there's a bunch of nobodies who are passionate, God can change everybody. I feel like I need to say that again. When there's a bunch of nobodies who are passionate, God can change everybody. And I'm, and I'm not saying don't take this demeaningly. You're not sitting here this morning and I'm like, God, these are the dogs. It's not that. It's not that. But I know because I've lived long enough in my 31 years of wisdom that all of us have times in our lives where we feel like a nobody, right? But look around you. You're part of something greater than how you feel. Because when God shows up, he does through you what he's going to do. And if you keep reading in Judges chapter 7, he takes Gideon with his 300 men and he divides them by three and he sends them in. And what happens to the Midianites is they don't even have to fight these guys. Just them showing up, the Midians turn in every direction and flee from them. Because when God's in you, you don't have to fight the battle. As I said last week, he fights the battle for you. When he's with you, you show up thinking, okay, I got my dukes up. I'm ready. Here we go. And God's like, no, no, no. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to fight me. You don't have to fight the people. I, greater am I who's in you than he who's in the world. And so I will fight for you. And so Gideon finds himself in a place where he's with the few, but the few make the difference. If you take a note this morning, here's a few things I want you to write down. I promise not to go too much longer. But here's some things to write down. First thing is that you cannot be effective in your life if you stay secluded because of your insecurities. If you crouch down here, you're down here, God, I just don't know why my dreams aren't coming true. Lord, you told me to start that business, and I'm just believing you to help me start that business. Been just right here believing you for 42 years. You told me to, you told, you told, you told me to help that person. God, I pray you would send someone to help that person because you know I, 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 if I give up my Starbucks to help that person, then I'm, I'm, I'm irritable when I don't have my coffee. Well, but, but, but God, I, I know, I know, I know you told me. I know you told me if I put you first, everything else will fall into place. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I don't want to get out of bed a half hour earlier to seek you. That, that's too hard. It's really, it's hard, God. Anybody else? It's hard, Lord. Uh, it's, it's really hard to have to, like, have to choose to, to take pay cuts to follow you. It's not all glitz and glamour when you follow him. It's real. You struggle at times. There's sacrifice. But what you see God do through you is so worth it that you don't care about all the crap you gave up to get there. It doesn't matter. But if you stay crouched down in your insecurities, you will never be effective. I was reading this morning about Martin Luther King. I didn't know this. Did you know that MLK struggled with depression his whole life? What? As someone that has a person that has struggled with, I haven't struggled with depression, but I've struggled with anxiety. There's often times where the things in your life that are going on inside of you make you think, well, I'm not qualified. I went to 48 prayer services, God, and I haven't been delivered. So I guess you just don't want to use me, so I'll just crawl back in my hole. What if MLK had said, oh, I'm depressed. I, who am I to get up there and say, I have a dream when I sit on my couch and I just see a black cloud over me every day? Who, who am I to stand up there and declare justice for a nation when, when, when I should be checked in somewhere because I feel so inadequate? But see, when Martin Luther King stood up at that podium, I was watching his speech this morning just trying to refresh my memory on it. You notice if you go home and YouTube it, he's not standing there alone. There's faces all behind him. See, that depression probably tried to back him into a corner. But instead of being under the tree backed into a corner alone, God said, no, 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 I got 300. They're standing here with you. I know you're trying to change a nation of millions of people, and I know that people are against you, and I know they're attacking you, and they're persecuting you, but I got 300. And they're standing up behind you. And when you're tempted to back down because of your insecurities, God's like, no, no, no. I put people in your life to pull you out and push you forward. The second thing to write down is that your expectations 
define your limitations or your strengths. You choose what they define. So many times in my life, I let my limitations define my expectations. And my expectations define my limitations. And so it's this vicious cycle of going around the mountain. I can't do it, God, because my mama didn't do it and grandma didn't do it. And you didn't ask them to be a pastor. Why'd you ask me to be a pastor? And you didn't tell them to go to Africa. Why do I have to do stuff in Africa? And you, you, you didn't ask them to start this place that all this time and it takes all this work. And I don't, I, I got this after school network and I have to go to meetings and I can't even, I don't even get paid, God. And oh, it's just, and God's like, shut up. Does he ever say that to you? Because I don't think of shut up as a bad word in my house. Maybe I will when I think it's a little older. So, but like, God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't do it because of all the stuff. You didn't do it because of who didn't did it. You did it. You do it. You did it because I called you to do it. And if you will stay the course and you will continue in it, I'll fight for you. But I think in my life, I would be limited if I didn't have people who pushed me forward. The staff of this church is incredible. The elders, the coordinators, man, I, I don't mean this wrong, so don't take this wrong. But if no one in this church ever said, hey, that was a great message, or that really impacted me or whatever, I'm actually really cool with that because our staff and coordinators are so encouraging. They send me texts, they send me notes, they send me things. It's this place where I feel like I've got this, this army behind me. I've been in a place in my life over the last year because we've had some stuff. Anybody have stuff? And what was awesome is for a while, they just kind of, they kind of let me sit in it. Kind of like God with Gideon. Okay, if you try the rug again, it's still dry, Dick Gideon. I, I know that you can do this, but if you don't think you can do it, so they kind of let you sit there. But over the last couple months, there's been more challenge. Like, no, we know you got this in you. You know you're called to do what you're doing. It, 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 all your failures only set you up for greater successes later. But I don't tell myself that because my saboteur comes and he's like, no, you can't do it and you're going to wreck this and yada, yada. And if I was alone here, I would be limited. But because there's people in my life who are trying to push me forward and when I'm broke, say, hey, we're with you. When I don't know what to do, we're with you. We're for you. We will stand up when you don't have a voice and you don't have the strength to do it. We'll be the voice for you. It's because of the people behind you. Next one to write down is when you feel inadequate, God calls you mighty warrior. Where do you feel inadequate in your life this morning? It's okay to define it. But then look at it through the eyes of God who says, I don't see that inadequacy. I see what's in you. And the last one to write down this morning is the limited number of people in your corner does not thwart the plans of God to affect major change through your life. The story of Gideon is so interesting because it starts off down here. And then it gets really glamorous, and he gets the battle. Like, Old Testament, that's huge to, to have warriors, right? Like, that wasn't just like, like, God knew what he was doing to let Gideon have the army of 22,000. When Kelsey and I first got married and started our first church in Michigan, we lived in a time of, I'm just being real, financial prosperity like I've never seen. And we were 27 and 24. 27 and 24, and someone gave us a 6,000-square-foot house. God told us to give you our house. What? That's that the kind of stuff, right? You're like, what? That doesn't happen. Our car died, and we couldn't afford to get a new car, and so we ended up getting this car that was way, way, way nicer than the car we had, and it was way less of a price. What? Well, well, how did all this stuff start happening? We would have people walk up to us and just hand us checks and say, God told me to bless you and take a vacation. And so we were traveling like some celebrities. We were in Grand Cayman, yeah. Yeah. You ever been there, y'all? It's some beautiful water. Can't afford to go back right now, but someday. Because we didn't, we didn't pay for ourselves to go there. Someone paid for us to go. And it was like God let us experience the 22,000. And then he said, hey, what you're doing over here, that's okay. But I've actually called you to, to pastor in the, the heart of the city, the, the inner city. There's not as much uh, money and provision and all that in there, but, but I promise if you give this up, I'll go with you. 
Sometimes letting the, 20, the, the, the 12,000 go or the 10,000 go to get to the 300 isn't easy. We laid in our California king-size bed where I was like, are you over there? We didn't have a kid. We had two kitchens, four living rooms, three dining rooms. It was nuts. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this to tell you something. I'm so grateful for that season because, one, it taught me about the generosity of people and the generosity of God. You want to talk about being humbled when someone sits in their office and says, this office is going to be yours. Oh, and by the way, I know you can't afford to furnish the house, so God told us to leave all the furniture, and we're just going to buy new at our next house. I've never, never, ever seen the generosity of people like that in my life. We had 13 people in our church, (laughs) and they'd come over to the pastor's house. It was embarrassing. (laughs) Don't worry, it's not the offering, I promise. (laughs) Right? But then God said, stand up in front of the church and just tell them, we're going to go into the heart of the city. And we're going to go help people that are broken and lost and hurting and they can't afford to keep your house. <laughs> Not that we were paying for it, but they can't, they can't afford to keep blessing you like people have blessed you. But I'm with you, Gideon. I'm with you, DJ. That was hard. I know, I know if you've never experienced abundance like that in your life, you're like, oh, you poor rich boy. That was hard. I, I'm not saying it like that. What I'm saying is that when you've experienced so much blessing and then God says, hey, I'm going to change some circumstances and I'm actually going to have you move from a 6,000 square foot house to a 570 square foot loft. It was a nice loft, but 570, our whole loft would have fit in our master bedroom in our house. And you show up and you live in this community and the very community that we moved into was actually the community that helped build our church. If we had never moved there, we wouldn't have had the church. But that process of getting rid of the 22,000 It was hard. It hurts. It took so much trust. We were living in a free house and went to a place where we had to pay rent. This free mansion. And then we moved to a place that we had to pay for and we couldn't even afford to pay for it. So we literally moved there by faith because God told us to move there. So we just moved in and went, I don't know how we're going to pay our rent, but I guess God will figure it out. And he did. People in our church started giving that had never given before. People would come to us and say, hey, I want what I give to go towards your housing. I didn't tell people I can't. I mean, I told my close friends, but I wasn't getting in front of the church saying, hey, we're moving here to help y'all, and we can't afford to live here. And people would walk up and say, hey, God told me to give this towards your housing. Because when he starts taking the stuff away, it's not that he's trying to take away anything. He's trying to show you that what's in you is so much more powerful because of whose you are. And that what little you have with the people behind you, that 13 people, literally Jesus and 12 disciples, changed the world. And that's why we're sitting here 2016, 17 years later. Because the people that are with you are greater than those who are against you. God calls you a mighty warrior. And it doesn't matter the limit of people in your corner. That does not thwart God's plans in your life. Turn over to Hebrews And then we'll close. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 through 3. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You can stand with me this morning. Here's what I want to encourage you as we close. You say, okay, I, I get everything you said, and man, if I, don't, if I get backed into a corner and I have people to push me forward, that's good. I got people for me, but, but, but that's great, Pastor, but there's no one in my corner. Here's what I want to encourage you. When your reality does not look like this, you say, that's awesome. Your staff and coordinators, they keep you inspired and they keep you going when you want to back down, but there, there's no one while I'm doing my homework and I'm ready to give up on this education I'll be in school till Jesus comes, folks, because I gave up my education 43 times. 
Still there. Anyways, okay. I got to do some homework. All right, so there's no one encouraging me to go forward. What I love about Hebrews 12 is here's what you need to know. There are generations of people who've gone before you. There's a cloud of witnesses in the spiritual realm above us. That when you don't have physical people behind you, you not only have the God of the universe behind you, you have our forefathers in the faith. You got Abraham and Isaac and Jacob saying, I know it looks hard, but keep running. You got Joseph saying, I know you're in a prison right now. Maybe you've been in prison physically and, and it's hurting and it's so hard and, and you're like, I, I don't know why I got there. Maybe, maybe, maybe your prison is, is, is an addiction or, 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 or uh, something that's falling apart in your life. I don't know what it is, but there's all, there's all this stuff against you and you're like, look, I've, my situations have got me here and there's no one behind me to push me forward. I want to encourage you this morning that even when physical people are not behind you, there's a cloud of witnesses above you who are cheering you on saying, you can do it. Because Abraham was the father of many nations. Joseph got out of prison and became second in command of Egypt. Stories go on and on. Queen Esther literally could have stopped a whole genocide in her generation because she wouldn't allow herself back here even when there was no one standing with her. If you're here this morning and you feel alone, I want you to know God is with you and there's a cloud of witnesses surrounding you. If you're in a place like I am where you physically have people around you, thank God for that and hold those people tight. And if you don't have it, ask him for it because he gives you the desires of your heart. He doesn't give you desires that don't line up to his. But he knew Gideon needed the 300 men. He didn't call him to go fight the Midianites alone. He said, take the 300 and go. So he wants you to have those people. If you don't have them, pray that he'll bring them. I can't give you a remedy to a four-step plan of how to get a good friend. I don't know how it happens, but ask God for that. But in the process of asking him for it, remember, you are a mighty warrior. And when you feel like you're backing down, that cloud of witnesses is saying, no, go, fight, don't give up, don't give in. Do what God has told you to do. And watch as the enemy flees. What, the enemy in our city I would say, there's a lot of enemies, right? It's not a person. When I'm saying watch the enemy flee, I do mean physically like the devil, like kick him out of here. But I mean like the enemy of our city is what? Drugs, brokenness, addictions, abuse. But as we unite together, we may not be a mega church, but we can be a powerful church that says together we will stand up like Martin Luther did. We will stand up and we will say no more injustice in our city. It doesn't matter how small we look. We will fight the battle ahead of us, believing that God can do the impossible through us. You are a mighty warrior. If you bow your head and close your eyes. No matter how alone you feel right now, you are a mighty warrior. I believe that's just, a, that's just something from God to somebody here today. You walked in here feeling so inadequate, so under-resourced, under-educated, ready to give up on what you're pursuing because there's no one standing with you. And I just want you to know that God is with you. And there's a great cloud of witnesses who've gone before you, who've, who've done exactly what you've done who stood the test and who are cheering you on from generations behind saying, go, go, go. You are not alone. And so all over this room, I just want to invite you to pray a prayer. Feel this repeat after me. Say, Jesus, let me know that I'm a mighty warrior. Let me know that I've got what it takes Remind me, God, that I am not alone. Bring me the people I need in my corner. Raise me up like Gideon, small but powerful, inadequate but unstoppable. Bring the people around me that I need for you to use me. And in the process, remind me of your love and those who've gone before. 
who are for me and waiting for you to break through whatever needs broke through. So today, God, once again, I surrender to you. I give up my own and I rely on yours. Help me to stop trying on my own strength and rely on your strength. Use my life to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you receive that this morning, you put your hands together and thank God he's for you. You are a mighty warrior. He's in.